Hey folks, so here we have a new cinema concept. Uh, it's a plan that's come past us from a long-term client actually, uh, building new homes. So the building is pretty well set. I've already gone underway. So the dimensions we have to work with. Unfortunately, the door was initially swinging into the front, what would be the front stage or the side of the seat. So without moving the door, we like to see the doors more in, uh, in this sort of range where the, the mouse is here. So it's, it's opening not into a potential speaker or subwoofer or lounge. Uh, that couldn't be done. So uh, they'll flipped it, at least on the building plan where this door is gonna open the other way minimizing some of the impact to what we can do in the room. So um, be nice if that was somewhere else, but at least they got us on board now to fix it up. So let's have a look at what we're doing here. This is the initial stages of a cinema design, the engineering elements to see what and how things will actually work. Uh, what we also saw in their initial builder plans was a backstage for the seats, uh, which was 1501. Now a lounge suite is going to usually for a row, we're looking for about 1800 to, to 2000 for a row, uh, which means 1500 isn't that suitable. Now with some little bit of consultation, we discovered that actually it's him, sometimes him and her, and it might be the kid, might be two kids, not a lot of entertaining, not a lot of guests. So really one row of seats is the priority. Now, if we pop a seating row on here, I'll just grab a typical sort of size seating row, lounge, lounge of four. Now you could argue if it's a dedicated hi-fi room, you'd want a perfect center seat. And three would be better, but we're gonna go with a, dual, a shared sweet spot here. Now they may choose a love seat, uh, which is kind of great because it keeps these uh, seating closer together. Therefore, in that sort of sweet triangle of sound, but should they choose individual armrests? Well, at least we've got a pretty suitable size seat here to, um, to consider. Okay, now if we put this seat onto the back, Area. Now you're gonna want a little bit of a step up. Maybe not, maybe you don't mind. Maybe you just jump straight on the seat, but no doubt you're gonna want a bit of a step up here. And that is, what have we got there? Okay, yeah, it's about a two, 300 step up. That's, you know, usual person size foots, two to 300. So, you know, you're gonna need the lounge here. Now, a lot of lounges, recliners, motorized recliners won't recline too far back from their default position and they kind of slide forward. So we may not have a drama of the actual seating hitting the back wall, but what is gonna happen is your head is right near the wall. Now, base energy is gonna bounce around the room. We have these uh, phenomenons, the base waves are gonna have what we call peaks and nulls, modal distribution, really big issue with small rooms. So that's something I'm gonna look at and calculate next. But Without even doing the math on this room, we know that a good seat is not near a boundary. Okay, so that's rule of thumb. We know that we're gonna have a lot of high pressure energy of the base near the wall, which is gonna be exaggerated, boomy, distracting, not clean, quick, and accurate. Now, if you've got a wimpy subwoofer and you want it loud, go sit near the wall. Though, when we're talking about clean, clear, accurate, you know, studio light re reproduction, which is of course the absolute goal in any cinema, is to hear what the director intended, your room's gonna exaggerate things. This is not gonna be a good spot to sit. Secondly, we want immersive surround sound. We want the effects, we want the environment, we want the, the little rustles in the trees, the crickets in the background, let alone, you know, the, the lightsabers and lasers that happen in and around us. To get that effect of, of space, and sound, we need a bit of distance for the speakers to create a nice wide sound stage. Putting speakers, say, surround back channel speakers right here and here, we've only got what, maybe 200 mil a foot of distance for that speaker to actually try and add some impression of sound stage. 
Furthermore, a speaker here is going to be very localized to this seat, and this person's not going to hear it. So we've got really a very narrow sweet spot, and we've got problems with bass. So this seating riser was really never going to work, and they've rightly so deleted that. And they're going to wait for me to come back to them. All right, so I know that we're going to need the seat somewhere around here to be able to get some surround sound in and around your head. You can't get sound out of a solid wall uh, as such, but we can get sound from open space, so we need some open space. Okay, so we know that we're going to sit somewhere around a quarter off the back wall. It's generally a good rule of thumb location. And let's have a look now. I'm going to put my little calculator in for the sort of sweet spot. So this is um, the medium listening position, the MLP. This is the medium location for the audience. Now, no one actually sits there in this design. But of course, we could have something like this, and someone does actually sit there. Now, another thing we could consider when designing the room is actually offsetting the room a little bit, because we do have a phenomena in any rectangular room where the perfect center of the room, be it center of the width or center of the length, is going to have a perfect sound wave hit the back, hit, hit the opposing wall. Sound's going to hit the walls and they're going to perfectly cancel in the middle of the room. So technically, sitting right smack bang in the middle of the room does actually have some inherent issues. That is, that cancellation that occurs with the sound bouncing, we can't do anything about it. You know, hits the wall, we put more power in, more power comes back to bounce off the wall and defeat itself, it nulls out. Put a little bit of power in, it hits the wall, it hit, cancels, hits itself, it cancels out. So technically, center center of a room is not a great spot. Goes the same thing lengthways, sitting in the middle. Typically, rule of thumb, not a great spot. Now, yes, multiple subwoofers do help to um, disperse and balance the sound out a hell of a lot more. But also, you could just not sit in a, in a dead spot in the room. Now, given that we've got a little bit of an entrance way, because even though the door's not swinging into the front stage here, we still need to walk into the room without hitting something, right? So I'm sort of under the impression if we offset the room a little bit, maybe by even just 300 mil a foot, then we can actually potentially get main seats out of center of the room. Or we've actually pushed this guy into the center of the room. This is going to have more problems than this seat acoustically. So the other option comes back into it that seats do indeed, if it's going to be a, a dual seat, I believe it is. So I'm going to design it this way because no seat is perfectly center in the room, which means no seat is going to have this cancellation issue of being perfect center. So this starts to work and we'll just see, keeping in mind, is this going to be a problem over here? That's what I'm a little bit sus about. Now there are some windows in the room. I'm going to look at them and consider them um, after I do these foundational work. At the end of the day, we can use soft curtains, soft furnishings, or even cover over the windows to suit ourselves acoustically with you as a wheel, here's a way. So I'm just gonna get rid of what was the riser. You can see where that riser was before. It's kind of halfway between where the seats likely wanted to go. So let's check out now um, the actual acoustic, the base analysis of this room next and see what that's all about. So this program's really cool. It's a simulation of what our frequencies are gonna be bouncing around and uh, causing the problems in the space. Uh, this one's called REW. It's the same math that the Harmon calculator, the Quest calculators, all these other guys are using. This one's nice and visual, and it even has multiple, multiple, multiple subwoofer options, up to eight, and it even factors in left and right speakers. Very handy if you're using 
uh, full range tower speakers then say a hi-fi slash surround sound solution or even of course it could just be purely a hi-fi system this this program worked perfectly for two channel uh, and you could even look at uh, doing your two channel plus some subs to to help manage the modal issues of, of that it's worked really well for us before we've had massive PMC studio level full range uh, three-way speakers with the additional sub boxes and by decoupling them because they were two separate boxes uh, and putting the sub boxes to the back of the room we effectively had a, um, a quad sub solution and the bass was just epic when, when we decoupled them and, and dispersed the subs around the room absolutely epic when they're all at the front of the room the bass was actually completely underwhelming considering we we're looking at four 15 inch transmission line speakers um, it was it was a game changer by distributing the base in the room which is exactly why we're here here we are in the simulator so uh, I've pop in the the measurements of the room now one issue is apparent straight away and and you guys may know but if not a square room is not desirable because the problem we have front to back of the room is mirrored pretty much left to right of the room which means you can see here there's a red line and there's a green line they're right next to each other this means that the frequency that's resonating and really being obnoxious and amplified by the room's natural response is occurring both ways so we've got one big monster problem um, really we prefer a room with odd length and width so that is the length and the width is not a multiple of each other um, so the same size or one and a quarter or one and a half if it was say 1.3 the width was uh, the length was 1.3 times the, um, the width that's a bit better combination so let's have a look here um, now I've already got an idea of where I'd pretty well like the seats to be by rule of thumb but I'm, I'm gonna further get clarity on where I want my seats to be based on what's possible with video so I'm gonna have a target of where I want the seats to be and then we'll see how that looks acoustically. So we've got some idea. And I'm gonna do that by looking at our, um, so we've got already some, sorry, some calculators here. And with the lines, we can see that the inside triangle, just as it hits the red is 36 degrees. This is really the minimal size for video. So if we have multiple, multiple rows that's what we'd be looking at for the back seats. Now the 60 degrees all the way out here on the end of the red, that's our maximum recommended size for video. Now I get it, some people like a bigger screen, that's fine. And that's something which in discovery, we talk about where people like to sit at the movies. So if you're like a front row person, you're gonna have to go 60 plus degrees. If you're like kind of more the middle of a cinema, you're gonna be like 45 to 50 degrees. If you like being at the front of the middle section, if that's the thing, which it is, um, then that's where I like to sit, then you're gonna be like 55 degrees sort of viewing. Uh, so use personal preference. I mean, whole point of a home cinema, a personal cinema just for you is it can be customized to your preferences. Typically, I like to get 45 degrees. Um, so you can see the green zone here. This is kind of my target. Now, where possible, because end of the day, the projection systems need a certain distance to be able to project a certain size screen. So we will request a certain screen size, but given the budget, we may not be able to afford the lens systems and the technology to just go any screen size we want. Now these brands like Barco Projection, uh, which are in the commercial space and the residential space, they can uh, have multiple lens options to suit the room and we can pretty much hit any target we want. But in this design, we got to be quite modest with our approach. So I know that there's a certain number of projectors off the shelf that are going to give us the sort of screen sizes um, or rather the lens technology we want combined in that one purchase. We buy the projector, we buy the lens with the projector, we'll see what size that can achieve, and that may be 
the maximal size we're realistically going to have because that's what the budget can fuel. Okay, let's check that out. So um, our target is going to be from about 45. So I'm going to go and also know as well that our projection screen's going to have to be most likely a solid screen. So I'm going to pretty well pick that the screen is going to be close to on the wall, but we could choose to bring that out a little bit still, regardless of it being acoustically transparent, that is speakers behind the screen or not. So let's check this out. Um, I'm just going to... Okay, so I've got my little line drawn here for 45 degrees in kind of a good rule of thumb spot for this seat so this starts to massage this into place now so let's lose the mlp the medium listening or and viewing position for that matter and let's have a look at some possible projection lens systems so here i'm factoring in that the projector is in the room we don't have the luxury of going behind the room we know that because that's an outside wall if it was a office a carport, a garage, a storeroom. These potential, we could actually put the projector behind in the other room, cut a portal between the two spaces. Happy days, we've just gained like two feet of extra throw distance, which is awesome because it's kind of nice not to put the lenses to the absolute max, max, max limit. Um, although that does help with some light output. Um, so yeah, we, we, we certainly like to look around the room to see, hey, where, where's some real estate? What real estate can we use for equipment, projection included? But in this installation, it's gonna be in the room. So I'm gonna factor in about 550 of distance to actually install the projector itself. Now, most home theater projectors are actually closer to 400 to 450 of depth. Um, and then we're allowing sort of 50 mil for maybe cables, connectors, a little bit of airflow. So this is quite a generous amount of space. Uh, we want to start off with something again, nice and practical, rather than pushing the absolute limits, uh, where we design a, a system and the likely products don't quite fit. That's a little bit, that's a little bit sad. Okay, so let's have a look here. So these are the the angles, the lens angles that are typical in most products. So. The smaller one here is something like the JVC's awesome product out of Japan. Uh, the new N series, amazing, their first 4K series of projector. Um, now, what seems to be true, a bit different to the Sony's, is the fact that the Sony's have, um, and the models have changed a little bit since I did this calculator, but the Sony's are actually over here on um, 1.3. So I'm going to change this here and just, just make a note that we've got Sony. 590 and 790 we're over here at a 1.3 throw distance uh which is really nice it can allow us some good size screens the jvc is a bit smaller um the n uh, you'll find that the n uh, 9 is probably around here and that's a nice unit so we've got i'm just going to change this here we got n9 it's closer to 1.3 four ish but we can fit the 1.3. Uh, we know that we're, we're on a winner um, quite easily. So we've got a little bit up our sleeve from that. But look, for this project, we're not going to have the luxury of certainly a Barco. Uh, you can get an idea of just how wide the lenses can actually go for Barco. They've got a 0.8 lens here, which has got me out of trouble a few times where we've wanted a really nice big screen and didn't have the throw distance. The... This is very generous, 1.3, because you can see here that on this line, let's see if I can just highlight that one, here we go. On that line, we're getting actually 45 degrees. That's our target size, which is awesome. So something like the new Sony 590, 570 will give us 45 degree viewing angle um, where we are here. So we know that's very possible on, you know, a projector that's not worth crazy money. The other cool thing as well, I've, I've been running the Epson 9400 for a little while. Um, that one's favorite projector I've tested um, this year for a sub $5,000. When I say money in this, guys, that's Aussie dollars. So in the US, times that by about 0.7 gives you your US more or less equivalent. 
uh, including tax, most likely. Uh, all our prices in, include tax. Um, now, the Epson 9400 is actually a 1.2. So it's actually out here. So the Epson can give us even closer to a um, probably 50 degree. Or what would that be? Let's measure it out. Uh, that's going to be so at 20... 2.6. Oh, now, of course, our seating's a bit closer than the projector itself. So let me see. It's probably easier if I just put the MLP back up. And what do we got here? 1.2 is out here in the middle of the green. Yep, close to that. So we're closer to 50 degrees, probably 48 degrees viewing by the looks of things there. If we go for the Epson, so that's awesome. Um, really quite a nice big lens on that Epson 9400. I'm impressed by that. Um, the colors are really impressive. The resolution's a bit lacking. You know, it says it's a 4K projector and it, and it does its shifty thing with the LCD panel, but the reality is the resolution isn't as, um, you know, maybe sharp and fine as some of the DLP competition around that price point. But the colors and the overall light output is really quite superior. Um, I would, interestingly, even though the Epson, you know, has the bigger lens, um, I would really stick it more to a 45 degree overall viewing distance because we'd start to resolve the LCD panel pixel resolution uh, if you push it beyond 45 degrees. So you could push an Epson up to 50 degree viewing angles you're going to see the pixely nature of it because uh, the LCD panel just isn't, you know, the, the pixels aren't so close together. Um, the 4K e-shift does help close that down. Admittedly, you'll have to 4K e-shift if you're going to go over 45 degree viewing angles. However, um, I find I get a clearer picture running it in 1080p. And I've tested this with the Lumigen Radiance Pro. I can pump any resolution to the, uh, the projector on, on show, um, 4K in, 1080 in, whatever coming in, you can then map that out to the projector. And um, so we've done all sorts of tests and I actually find that we get a clearer actual image with it in 1080p mode um, than pumping 4K in, 4K, oh, admittedly even, even well, that was with using the Lumigen, I must admit. So, um, Maybe 4K in, but not e-shifting, um, I think was the end result there. You can try it for yourself though. Um, and you know, I'm nitpicking, I'm nitpicking, but it's a trade-off between pixel res and actual video resolution. Um, all right, hope that makes a little bit of sense. I do, I go off on tangent a little bit. Uh, but I think it's cool to talk about some current models, some realistic products to actually support these designs as we go along. So I'm pretty satisfied here that with this seating distance and the and the size of the room, we're going to hit 45 degree viewing angles, which are awesome. So it'd be really nice. And I actually hadn't plot those seats there prior. I didn't do some extra work, so I kind of did a pretty good guesstimate on that one. So that's about you now you see once you recline, your, your head really is right on the back edge of these seats. So I'm going to put the, the viewing around there. Let's see if I've done the same. Yeah, oh, actually, yeah, look at that. That means these seats can go forward a bit to match up with the actual calculator. It's obvious there's plenty of room for the seats. So that's no big deal. Um, all right, so let's see how far back these seats are sitting. About 460 millimeters. All right, back to our base analysis. Over here we can put, let's say 460. I did that wrong. What do we got here? 860. All right. It's obvious I'm a bit dyslexic, right? So um, if you guys want to comment, tell me all about that. No shit. Okay. So uh, we're going to go 860. If I just click that, it should allow me to, there we go, use the key. I'm hovering over it. There we go, hover over it. I can just use the key uh, keyboard to maneuver it. Whereas using the mouse, it sort of jumps around a bit. 
Um, 50, now to be fair, now none of our seats are actually sitting halfway in the room, the way we've designed it so far. So realistically, no one's gonna sit here, even though that's our medium location for doing viewing angles and speaker plots and potentially SPL uh, for a, a family mode of listening. Um, acoustically, this is not relevant because we're not sitting here. So we're gonna add an extra seat here, microphone position, which mimics the seating positions. And I find usually we're about 60 to 70 um, centimeters, a couple of feet next to each other in a typical seat. So let's check that out by adding that sort of distance, left and right. Let's have a look to left to right. And let's now also move this into where the seats actually are. So I'm gonna measure, where's the middle of this seat? 1962 from the wall. And that's mirrored on each side. So let's check this out again. So 1962 from the side wall using the keypad, 19, so what's that, about 1960. Check that I got that right, because I did get it wrong before. Uh, 19, yeah, oh, 19, yeah, 1960, happy with that. By the way, I'm using the SketchUp program here for all these um, measurements, it's awesome. It's down to, you know, millimeter perfect, which is good enough for us. Um, Okay, back in here, we are 1960 from the side wall and we're 86 from the back wall. So let's see what that looks like for this, in this case, these three seats. We've got the seat left of center, right of center, and the far, or what, what would be the far right seat if it was a row of four. And I'm just gonna double check that that's a good seating distance apart for microphones. Now, Matt, I'm going to increase this a little bit because if they're going to do it armchairs, it's going to be at least 70, um, 700 mil. Uh, and of course, if it's a curved, if it's, you know, you've got the wedges in here to curve the seats, then it's going to be even closer to 800, actually. Um, so uh, I think 70, 70 is pretty good for the distance apart. So we're just going to check that's still on point. It is. All right, cool. So. Now we can start to see, this is one subwoofer in the front corner of the room. This is where I often see subwoofers because, you know, real estate wise, great spot for it. Front left corner, not gonna work. That's our entrance, uh, which is why, you know, if, if for some reason we do have a speaker here, having a door upstream of the front stage, usually, particularly if you're gonna have maybe an acoustic baffle wall or a bigger acoustic screen and we're gonna have stuff behind it, we're gonna have a rack of gear up the front somewhere as well. That all needs about 600 to 700 mil. 600 is usually kind of the, the most we can squeeze it in if we're gonna have a rack of gear as well, which means the door should really be from the front wall by about 700 to 800 to give you a bit of clearance. It's the best spot for a door. Uh, it's also not opening into the lounge. So you know, it's opening into this nice open space here. Um, if we see that again, the door was opening in like this. Equipment, rack, screen here, open space, onto your seat, happy days, better spot for a door. Okay, okay let's have a look. This, uh, now we got a normal height here of one meter. You, when you recline, you're a little bit lower, but one meter is a good medium between sitting upright and reclining right back. So one subwoofer in a room, you can see here, we have got a peak here of around 30, what are we, about 36 hertz. So the room's gonna resonate and exaggerate this frequency. Further downstream, we've got another one here at 72, which is also in the subwoofer range. Subwoofer is usually cut off about here, about 80. So from the 80 mark onwards, we're not too fussed about what's happening here. And you can see it becomes more kind of randomized, which is, which is actually good. Uh, so below here, let's have a look. So the main seat has really got a big null here. It's not happy at all. The other seats, you can see it's a bit irregular. 
So this person, which is to the left, is experiencing quite a different, actually they're, they're out of balance here. They should be pretty much mirrored. Let's see if I can move this across a bit more. Okay, that's a little bit better. So we've got this, this seat about 1960 from that wall and this is about 19.7 from that wall. So they're kind of mirrored center of the room. And then we've got this outer seat over here, which actually in some respects is the better seat. As you can see here, we got this nice and solid through here, a bit of a dip here, and then they're all pretty similar here. Now, what's the goal here? Number one, we want a nice slab of base, which means everything is full. We had really we're looking for a, a line left to right, which means we've got every frequency of the base is going to be heard at the same sort of level as any other note rather than this note's playing louder because of the way the room's resonating in the room, it's amplifying some notes more than others. The other thing I want to see here is not only that we've got a nice flat line for a seat, we actually want to make sure that the other seats aren't crappy. So we don't want, you know, in this case, you know, this seat's not very good. So if we go to EQ, now this would be a bit silly because it's a bit of a cancellation point, but we try and add more energy into this seat. Chances are, because it's a bit of a cancellation point, we'll only achieve a little bit of energy, but these guys are going to be now poking up over here. So the point is, if we EQ for one seat, we want it to be beneficial to all the other seats in the room. So we really want all of these lines mapping very similar to each other. So when we go to do any final equalization, then it's EQing and improving all of the seats. If we were to... EQ, like I say, just for this one, it's maybe trying to improve the energy for this seat at this frequency, but now these guys, they're actually got good energy already, so now we're actually causing a distraction. We're actually improving this seat while we're ruining these seats. Uh, I hope that makes sense. So, now what's going on here? We've got one subwoofer over to the left, not a very good spot. Let's check out some rule of thumb locations. So, center, middle of the room. Hey, that's not too bad. Not too bad, this gets a bit messy. You know, we've still got this peak here. Now the thing is, this peak I'm not gonna be too alarmed by because we can EQ that out. It's really easy to discover the frequency of calibration. If we just put less energy into this signal, the room's gonna then amplify it. So we, we put less energy in, room amplifies it, and then we're back to a flat line again. So we can take care of peaks quite easily by just not adding so much energy in. So the soundtrack calls for this much, we'll put less in, the room makes up for it, we're back to a nice flat, solid slab of bass. Where our danger zones are is these, these nulls, these, uh, these areas here, where these low energy, it can be very difficult to, uh, because they're, they're bouncing around, cancelling each other out, if we put more or less power into a null, we get the same result, which is nothing. So they're the real problem areas. Now what we do want is to see that the seats are experiencing similar sound. So if we EQ this out, you can see here, we're actually gonna get rid of this problem for all of the seats actually evenly. So that's a great result. Now if we go along here, we get rid of this null here, oh, sorry, this peak. Then we've got good base energy, good base energy, good base energy. That's kind of nothing. This is a bit of a problem. And it does get a bit messy in here between some of the seats. This is a bit of a peak. This one's a bit of a null. Uh, now, which seat is that? So we've got the left side, a little bit of a peak at 80. This side, a bit of a null at 80. So there's a little bit of contradiction here. But everything lower is actually pretty good, and that's manageable. So not ideal, but a lot better by moving the sub into the center of the room. Uh, let's see if we go center side. Oh, pretty ugly. So we've got a major cancellation for this guy. The way that the sub is 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 creating energy in the room due to its location. Because you've got to remember that the, the subwoofer is both constructive and destructive. And the walls are reflecting back. So the subwoofer's energy itself is like a wall. It's pushing sound. 
So as we add more subwoofers in the room, it's, it's a bit like we're creating new boundaries. We're creating a new uh, net sum result in the room. So by moving the subwoofer around, we're getting this different response. The walls are fixed. We can't really change those. Yes, we could put some dampening and acoustic control in the room. However, to dampen and manage bass, 80 hertz and under the subwoofer range, it's large, thick, expensive product to get that job done, or it's slim, low profile product that costs 10 times more again. So we really don't want to rely on uh, basic absorption to be the solution to the room. It can be a nice to have, or if we've got a particularly challenging room, massive hi-fi speakers at the front, seats at the back, then we're gonna have to look at some of that. Now you gotta remember in cinema, we've got a lot of DSP, digital sound processing equalization power. So knowing that we've got this tool avail available, again, means that these peaks are not such a big concern. Seat uniformity is, and these big nulls here, that's bad. This seat is not gonna have a very good experience. They're gonna hear these notes, and this is gonna be like basically just masked, nothing there. Not very cool. All right. Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll make an example of how this seat would sound. So you know how you get that like bass drop? It might be, um, you know, ah, the Matrix. So he flies in the air, slow mode, hovering in the air, and the camera's spinning around him. He does that sort of sound. Sorry, guys, I'm doing my best effort here, right? So it has that like bass drop. It goes that means the frequency is sort of slowly moving down the range. What you're gonna hear is boop, bit of a null, boop, that'll resonate for a bit, and then it's gonna miss half part of this drop, and then it's gonna resonate again. It's not gonna be that nice, even drop of sound. It's gonna sound a bit weird, actually. Let alone if you've got an instrument wanting to, you know, you've got bass plucking here, that this bass note's gonna be very lost. And then this bass nose plucks and it stands out and it sounds really weird. So particularly double bass, um, you know, it, it's going to sound, jazz would not sound good with a bass response like this. Um, but, you know, movie soundtracks have music playing all the time. You know, there's some cool movies that have that jazz, jazz background sound, uh, double bass playing. It's going to sound terrible. All right. And, you know, Michael Bay, Transformers, you know, famous super action hero um, uh, style director. Man, he uses, he uses his bass range all the way down to 20, right? 20, a solid 20 hertz is hard, hard to achieve in cinema. So I'm, you know, I'm looking for 30. If it slowly ramps down, you know, no problems. We can get a good 30. I'm happy. But, you know, Michael Bay, Transformers, man, he, he uses this range. Uh, the modern soundtracks are awesome. Okay, back to this base analysis, right? Um, now let's see, let's go to the back of the room because it is a different relationship from a sub here and a sub here and a bit messy as well. I'm just gonna choose a different speaker where the driver's facing ahead. This program, I, I think actually does factor that in a bit differently. So we'll go 50% center back. Now you might say, well, hang on. Um, you know, my front speakers need the sub to support them for bass. Um, isn't that going to be weird if my, my center channel bass gets converted to a subwoofer behind here? Um, yes and no. Um, at 80 hertz and under, it, it's claimed that it's not very, it's not directional. It certainly isn't very directional at all. Not directional um, is, it's, you know, it can be debated, but let's face it this way. THX, the THX program, says 80 hertz, crossover there, and it's it's pretty well omnidirectional. That is, you'll hear the sound from the center, and any bass-associated information that comes from this guy, it's going to pretty well blend, right? So so this isn't a terrible spot for a sub. If we're running over 80 hertz and we had smaller satellite speakers, could be a bit more of an issue. And you've got to remember the LFE channel, the low frequency effects channel, the 0.1 channel in our Dolby and DTS soundtracks. I won't talk about IMAX, they do things differently and I'm already going way off topic. 
in this uh, presentation, but the 0.1 soundtrack and its low frequency effects, this is the soundtrack that can run up to about 120 hertz. They usually run 80 and under, but they can run up to 120. You might say, well, that's directional, so um, that may need to be somewhere specific. Well, the LFE channel doesn't have a location to it. The small speakers in the room that then associate the bass do have a location. So technically the bass coming out of say the center channel, bass technically should then come from the front center. So in very high end systems, we might have many, 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 many subwoofers in the room supporting the uh, effects in the LCR, the LCR being the left, center, right, the main channel speakers. And we can actually associate which subwoofer looks after which satellite speaker, and then all the subwoofers play the LFA. Very, very cool stuff. It is the more elite end of the market. So um, that's where, you know, we need to factor in these things. So in this project, we need to be good value here. We're gonna cross over around 80, uh, as long as all our speakers can handle that. Um, and we're gonna sum the, all of the base to the subwoofers, and we're gonna use the subwoofers collectively create our base energy. It's, it's by far the best value way of doing it. And then when it comes to associated bass and stuff, yeah, it's even better and it's gonna cost you a ton more. So um, yeah, we're starting off with good value. Okay, back to the center of the room, the sub. How's it looking? Nasty, right? This Now this peak is always here. That's the room always resonating. It's it just, it's aggravated by that note. And now we got these dips and random dips in the room. Pretty terrible, that's that's not good. So center back, not good. Over this side, whoo, it's the worst we've seen yet, right? So where are we, this seat? That is basically under, what's that, 36 hertz? You're not gonna hear that, you're not gonna notice it. It's gonna be masked so much. In fact, and this is interesting, I'm actually gonna pull up the graph. All right, quick graph here. Thank you very much, UNSW Physics for this one. Um, now you can see here, um, sound frequency. So we go from, you know, 20 Hertz is, is really the least we can, we hear at. So 10 Hertz is not relevant. 2020, 20, they say, so, um, 20 Hertz to 20 K. Now, how sensitive are we to different frequencies? Now, shouldn't it be too much of a surprise? See this little, little bump here it means that we're rather sensitive to the mid range. It's where, uh, our dialogue, where people talk around in this mid-range. So of course, one of the most important things for humans to dial into is, or has become, other people making noises. Now you see we're quite sensitive. Um, sorry, not sensitive here. Yeah, so it's, yeah, so sorry, so this shows how much level is required for us to hear it. So there's only this little bit of level and we can hear in this sort of mid to high area. This is the first frequency we're gonna notice. Now, as the energy goes up, it, it sort of compresses somewhat. So when it's very, very, very quiet, we hear this. We don't hear the highs very well. We hear the mid range very well. Threshold, there you go, it said it right there. <laughs> um, but check out the bass. We can't, we can't perceive. Here's the subwoofer range here, right? We, we, if it's running at 30, 40, 50 dB, we hardly ever notice it. We don't even perceive that the base is there. So we need to turn the level up. So we turn the level up. 20 decibels, what's that, FONS? That's a different rating again. So we keep turning the level up. So now this is sort of, okay, this is where a movie soundtrack sort of lives. This is where maybe human speech lives around here, around the 60, 70 to 80 decibels. This is the real life area through here. I'm not sure what the blue one's trying to show. All right, so it means that everything now is a lot more balanced. It's not such an extreme, but what, what the point here is, is that it takes a fair bit of energy to hear low bass. We need a fair bit going on before we even hear it. But here's the thing, right? Once we hear it, it's only a small notch more for us to perceive a lot more bass. Whereas in the mid-range, we need to go all the way up here in SPL. 
And there's a big perception difference here. And a, and a lot of energy. Here, it takes a lot of energy just to hear it. And it's a bit more energy to make it sound somewhat louder. So this is, this is the drama with the bass with home cinema. Is, you know, this technically means we can't hear it. It's under the threshold, 55 dB. You know, so we need this low bass energy right up here around 65, 70 just to hear it. But then this peak here, which is up by about 10, 20 decibels, means that it's actually sounding like it's like four steps louder, five steps louder in pressure. But all of this should be playing at the same level. So you can see how messy this is going to be. Our jazz double bass player is not going to sound real good when he hits those lower notes. And our Michael Bay soundtracks... Um, any soundtrack, I mean, any cinema soundtrack is trying to replicate the real world. So even, you know, not even those fancy Matrix scenes, when the door slams on the side of the car, it's going to have that clap and it's going to have that oomph to make it sound full-bodied and real. That, that oomph in the car door slamming is like right down here. You want to feel that. So it's all these more delicate sort of sounds that we experience in cinema that makes us feel there. It's not just about the cannons and the lasers and the, and the explosions. It's all this other natural stuff as well. All righty. I hope we're learning a bit here, right? So um, I figured for this one, you know, it's learning a little bit of why rather than not just what. Um, okay, so this is a bad spot for a sub. Let's try over here. You know, not, not, real, not real great. So let's flip this back to one. What was our best one? That was pretty good. That's pretty good. Now this is this is a bit nasty. So let's see if if we go forward. Now our reference is eighty six. If we go forward a bit, ah, it's actually looking a little bit better for some of the seats. Keep going forward. Now it's now we're getting this big hollow out of sound. That's no good. All right, let's go back again. So what's there? That's so it's getting close to that fifty. Let's check that out. Fifty percent of the room. So we're sitting smack bang. So that's the halfway point here in this room. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's why we don't sit in the middle of the room. That is, that's terrible. We know, you know, we need 60 to 70 dB just to hear the bass. We're only going to hear probably 10% of the subwoofers. It's really sad, right? You can pay serious money on subwoofers, sit in the middle of the room, put it center middle, you're not going to hear half of it because the room's just going to cancel it out. It's like this is reality. So all right, let's bring us back to where we were. Is that 86? A little bit peaky in here. Let's bring them forward again. We're not really losing that, that little null there in here. That one's a bit of a problem which is this guy. It's actually both of them. Makes sense because they're mirrored in the room. And then this one's, this one's better. So look, this is also what we call rather high Q. That is, it's quite narrow. So it, it's less perception when it's high Q. That's still not, not ideal. It's the best we've got so far, right? It's not ideal. So sub center in middle of the room, Pretty good spot. It's a rule of thumb spot. If you've got a cabinet of gear there, probably not going to put it there, right? So this is really important to know where the subs need to go before you decide to put a cabinet somewhere. Let's see if we can improve on this by adding a second subwoofer. Actually, before we do that, let's go left to right in the room. Let's see if there's some extra gold here. Not really. And it's kind of obvious because we've already got seats left to right of each other. So all we've done is we've put this seat where that one was before. So I'm just going to have to follow the mouse around a bit, guys, to see what I'm doing. We haven't included in already. All right. I guess not, not bad, but we, let's see if we can improve it. So let's look at a second subwoofer. Now, the subwoofer choice here is um, a sealed sub that goes down to, say, 30 hertz until it starts rolling off. Pretty realistic. For a good value sub, you know, a couple grand maybe, 
uh, for something like this um, versus, you know, if you go five hertz lower, probably double the money. Um, let's see what we do if we go a ported sub. Yeah, no, it just, just changes the bottom end a little bit. Okay, let's go a second sub. Let's see what's going to happen here. All right, some weird stuff. Okay, let's, now let's see if I actually, before we do this, I'm going to save, I'm going to save P1. There we go, that's the best one we got. So save that P1. Let's add a second subwoofer. And let's first go the quarter points of the room. This is another rule of thumb spot. Can work out really good in some rooms. Hmm. Really, really high Q there. So it's not going to be too noticeable, to be honest, that one. But it's still not great. It's not ideal. Um, this, we can EQ that. EQ that, EQ that. But then it, it ramps down pretty quick towards 80. That's not, it's not shocking. And, you know, an auto EQ system would tidy that up quite well. What we don't want the auto EQ system doing is, yeah, off trying to fix this null. Because you can see the other two seats are quite happy. That seat, it's weird, that seat not so good. That seat's pretty good. So this would be really the sweet spot in this room because it's the closest to the center of, of the room. Um, this one, interestingly, not quite as, as nice, but it's, like I say, quite high cube, not going to be so noticeable because uh, the bass notes will kind of sweep, sweep past that. You know, it's only a small crack in the path. But you can see the auto EQ, well, the auto EQ should actually look at the two of these and decide not to do anything with that. Otherwise, if we try and improve this, it, it's not really going to do anything because it's obviously a little null. Um, it won't improve that seat even if it tries, but it could exaggerate these other two seats. So in EQ, do nothing with that. That's for, and look, the, otherwise, like improving that improves all seats, improving that improves all seats, improving that improves all seats. Not too bad, right? So um, let's see now um, a different situation. Let's move this guy back to center. Fun and games, right? You know, you, you, it's jumping down the rabbit hole. We never quite know where we end up when we start playing around with this. And I can tell you, every room is different. Every room is a little bit different. Every room's kind of the same size, <laughs> four by five-ish meters, um, yet every room's a little bit different. So um, I can't really, I don't go back to a previous job and open up the save template and go from there when it comes to this stuff. It's always a bit of a fresh crack at it. Um, all right, so that's not good at all. This is the, the seat to seat consistency is really bad at what, 70 something hertz. Um, a little bit hollowed out here as well, so that's not too flash. It's a bit of a roller coaster ride doing this. Can't do that because of the doors there, but if we cross them over, see what happens there. A bit messy. Let's see if we go halfway through the room. This should usually cancel this null here out quite good by, not cancel it, but or this peak should lower in energy, should I say. So this energy has come down quite significantly. There's nothing in here. That's a shocker. About 50%. Never mind visually what's happening here exactly. Well, actually, you can see that that driver is in line with that driver. The boxes are a bit out of alignment because of the driver position. Always go for uh, the data on the side of the sheet here. All right, let's go back into the middle. Ah, whoa, that's not too bad. That extra sub still running. Let's try over this side. Yeah, not, not too great. That's interesting, this one over here, right? Very uniform between all seats. Happy about that. So I don't know if it's really achieving, let's save that, it's really achieving a whole lot more than, um, than the one sub, as far as uh, distribution goes. Here we go, this, this other 25% mark. That's pretty good. That's a little, this one, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna fuss too much about that. I mean, I wouldn't sit in this seat, I'd sit in this seat, so granted. 
Let's save that one. Okay, first first option, single sub, bit messy in here, not super great. Check out the this dual sub, a lot more uniform, really quite solid. This is a little bit different here, but we're kind of we're starting to roll off the sub here. So we're gonna have other speakers really doing some work around 80 hertz, so that should disperse this better. Uh, let's see, load P3. Very, very, very uniform bar this one location. So let's just see, if we go forward a bit, does that change somewhat? Not in a big improvement way. Back. Yeah, you can see, again, I, I meant, like I mentioned at the start, put your seats near the boundary. Look at that, no, that is, yeah, that's a, that's a mess. That's where these guys were going to sit originally. Um, moving forward, this is kind of my, you know, kind of target sweet spot. So now everything fits nicely. If we go forward a bit, we do gain extra energy. We do gain extra energy. We gain extra energy here before this guy starts to, now it's disappearing. So it's probably... And that's dipping down. So coming forward a bit fixes up this guy here. This one isn't really changing. Like I said, I'm not I'm not as fussed about about this one. So we've we've got a good we've got increased our energy coming forward a little bit. We're now at a, a meter forty from the back wall. I'm happy with that conceptually uh, because not that I'm settling on this right now, but just just got a. Look how our best options looking. We bring that forward to here. And guess what? We've just scored a bigger screen because we're sitting closer to it. Of course, we have the impression of a larger, bigger, more immersive size picture. Um, that's good. So that now means that our, um, what was a 45 degree, um, rather comfortable 45 degree uh, viewing uh, with the lens systems we know are available. This is actually increasing us now. So the max screen size stays the same. If say we, I'm just using the the middle option here, the Sony. Um, that is now pushing us halfway into this green, or part way into the green. Yeah, about 48, 48 degree viewing. Happy days with that um, screen size. Let me actually let me just. There's too much stuff going on here. Okay, that's that screen we could achieve here. So we've gone beyond 45. We're sort of on our way to 48, 47 degrees. It's actually the size I've had in my showroom, this current showroom for the last nine months. And it's um, it's nice. It is nice. Um, I like it bigger. The new showroom will be bigger. We've got more room. Uh, I'm literally, it's quite funny. My projector, because we had a room in a room, where the projector is, we've got a hole there, and it pushes all the way back to the blind, the uh, the window furnishing in the original room, just to get an extra 200 mil of uh, throw distance to give us the biggest screen possible. So it's very similar to this room's, what this room's achieving. So this is cool, right? So we, oh, sorry, actually, look at this. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll just check. Oh, no, sorry. Yeah, no, that's all correct. My seat didn't move. My, my, my... MLP, medium listing position calculator, did move, my seats didn't move. That is all now looking pretty good. Now, the seats in the way of a door, no, happy days. Um, have we actually created more spaciousness to our sound by having more space behind us? Yes, we have. Our effects channels will sound better with more space behind us. And now the seats are sitting in what looks to me to be you know, more or less the sweet spot for bass. You know, we've got this, like I say, the slab of bass. We can pretend we can put a line across here all the way down to 80. It's rolling off a bit. This high Q for one seat's not ideal. These little peaks, we can fix that up. I'm pretty settled on, on, on the way this is looking, actually. Now, this door or this entrance, the door's going the other side of the room, but this entrance isn't isn't going to be infringed with the subwoof there. Um Got a quite a convenient location for those subs as it turns out. Now I might play a little bit more with this for some more obscure 
locations. But ideally, I know that we've now got our seats in a really good position. And at final calibration, the calibrator will be able to maybe tweak these positions in and out a little bit, tweak the seating position in and out a little bit, a couple hundred mil, maybe a foot, maybe half a foot here and there, to just find that sweet spot. But we know now we're in a great location acoustically for this room, for this main row of seats. Okay, so here we have the initial floor plan fundamentally set out. We know that our screen size is going to be immersive at about 48 degrees viewing angle. Actually, I can tell you exactly what that is by pinning our calculator here. 23.3 each direction. I will use the calculator. Yeah, 46.7, 47, say, degrees viewing. Um, from a um, anything like a Sony or a, uh, an Epson projector is going to achieve that sort of screen size. So that would be really nice projectors um, anywhere from let about four grand Aussie through to, you know, some nicer Sony stuff. Um, so there's a range of budgets. We're not, not forced into a uh, particular price point. Um, now, LCR speakers, sorry, I should, should divulge a little bit on that. LCRs want to be from 45 to 60 degrees width. So they could sit just outside of the screen frame area here. I actually quite like them between 50 to 55. So they could sit on wall or freestanding either side of the screen. We know our LCRs are good. The door's not opening there now. That is good. If there is a speaker there, you're going to have to, um, uh, let's see, where's that door opening? It's swinging that way. Yeah, so you just have, you have to just scoot past the speaker there. That, that works. Not ideal, but it works. Now effects channels. We know that we want effects channel in this range. It's 90 to 110 degrees behind the seat. So effects channel through here, that's our surround speakers. Our back channels are in this area. Now you can imagine, we have a back channel here dispersing out. And we can aim and we actually want to aim and point all the speakers, but you know, the chance of this person and this person to hear the speaker, is actually pretty good. And these, both these seats are going to get a really good range of that sound. Um, Whereas before, when it was really close, you know, you're getting snooked. It's not going to work. So this is a great, great spot for these seats. Okay. Guys, I think I'll stop there. It's like been an hour-long um, presentation of, uh, of this initial design concept, the floor plan. This is what I call the optimized element of any design we do. Every single room, every single design goes through this process. This is a service that we can offer. Check out our website. Um, for more uh, inspiration and services uh, to learn you know, just how this is done. Now, all of the angles, the dimensions, the calculators, they are available on online. Um, the REW program is free. The Harman calculators are free. Uh, you could probably get a free trial and sketch up, draw up all the room. I would absolutely urge you, if you're going to go DIY, you do exactly what I'm doing. This is how we do uh, get all the insights. And you can just imagine... When it comes to speaker location, angling the speakers, um, furniture, decor, the acoustics, the reflections that are happening in this room, all of that has to be built off this platform. This has to happen first. Um, and that all involves a whole lot more work than even this stage. But this is the optimized element. And it's a critical part for any amazing cinema room. These seats are now very similar like sitting in the middle of a sports car with a mid-mounted engine. Everything is really well laid out um, versus, you know, uh, 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 say so something like the old Jags, that big V12 up front. Um, probably not the best handling car in the world. Um, so, you know, if you get the good seats in a good spot to start with, happy days. All right, guys. If this video has been helpful for you, please like it. If there's anything I've skipped past and you've gone, what the hell is he talking about? Ask a question. I'll, I'll fill that in. I'll uh, let you know just what's going on here so you can understand just how important this stuff is. You can go at it DIY. You can get a professional like myself or a local guy, professional, to help you out. Um, but I'll be always looking at plans like this that clearly communicate the engineering work that's done and it's going to help you with the next steps in the planning. Save you bucket loads of money, let alone 
the performance, which is absolutely sitting on the table with every project. Guys, hoping this has been really great. I'll catch you next time.